Welcome everyone to another episode of NAPO's podcast, Stand Out. I'm Claire Kumar, Productivity Catalyst, and thrilled to be your host. As you know, I'm thrilled for every, every episode. Today, I'm really excited because we're talking about something that doesn't often get talked about. I am talking about, um, you know, really appealing to those who are interested in becoming a productivity or organizing professional. And those of you who are running your own business, really getting in touch with the best way to run that business. We've, you know, we might be calling ourselves entrepreneurs or solopreneurs, but I want to encourage you as my guest today, Jeffrey Shaw will do to talk about yourself as being self-employed. He wants you to be proud of that. And it's not only because you're doing great things in serving others, you're also a great part of the economy. And this really needs to be recognized. Um, and and what, it's one of the parts of the economy which we've witnessed this year that grows, especially when, when we're under economic challenge. So you're an important piece. And, and what's been missing is really a lot of guidance as to how to be self-employed and how to create that business and life that you love together. A lot of us are kind of winging it and figuring out things on the fly. Now, Jeffrey's latest book, The Self-Employed Life, Business and Personal Development Strategies That Create Sustainable Success is a fantastic resource for us. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. It is part practical marketing guide and part spiritual guide to creating that well-integrated business and personal life. So let me give you a little bit of information about Jeffrey. Early in life, Jeffrey saw an opportunity to make some money by going door to door selling eggs. Now, he didn't just say, just take the eggs and take them door, door to door. He thought about this. He thought, I can mark them up and I'm gonna make these authentic farm fresh eggs by leaving a little bit of chicken poop on one or two eggs in the mix. So this, all of a sudden, now you can get an idea of Jeffrey's creative spirit, his love and, and just natural knack for being an entrepreneur, which he has been for his whole life. He moved through entrepreneurial roles to land on what he does now. He is a speaker. He is, has a fabulous TED Talk, which you must look up. He is the author of his, his first book, Lingo, really teaches you to embrace how to speak with your clients and have that language of connection land with them. And he is, of course, the author of The Self-Employed Life and a podcast by the same name with 30,000 listeners per month. So we're, it's a blessing for me to be talking to Jeffrey today. I, I can learn a lot every time we interact. So, and as well, if you're lucky enough, you can work with Jeff as a, as a business coach for, for a small business. Um, so always keen on self-development. Jeffrey has been learning his whole life. This is evidenced by his admission to reading an hour every morning with a cup of chai. And I kind of do the same thing. Maybe this is why I love you so much. And also by testing out what works. So I really wish I had seen you, Jeffrey, as a young, a young boy adopting that power pose, which you described was somewhere between Superman and RuPaul. So... <laughs> Jeffrey believes, and I quote, being in business is not a position of authority, but rather a privilege to serve and contribute to the greater good. Welcome so much, Jeffrey. Oh my gosh, that was such a fantastic intro. That was, that was my life in a few minutes. I love it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, it's an inspiring life, which you pepper through the book. You share a lot about your own journey and the lessons that you've learned. And then you also bring in some fantastic influence, like quotes from Jim Rohn and Chip Conway or Conley, I think it was. Conley, yeah. Chip Conley. Conley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really peppered with wonderful insights. You, you spend a lot of time exploring mindset which is really uh, important. And I loved in particular the point you made about having a ritual around trust. I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about that and how it fits into what you call the self-employed ecosystem, which it mirrors an ecosystem in nature, right? With its elements of energy, water, nutrients, living organisms, oxygen. So can you dive in and help us you know, understand how trust fits into this and, and this wonderful self-employed ecosystem. Sure. You know, I think inherently when you're self-employed, uh, you inherently think that everything's up to you. And let's face it, we self-employed folks tend to be controlling 
because it's maybe our name on the business, or maybe it is, you know, we are the forefront person. So we take such high responsibility that, uh, that I, I think our trust inherently gets weakened without our realizing it because we are inadvertently training ourselves to behave in a way like everything's up to us. It will only turn out right if we do it and the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And whether we you know, believe we have strong faith, we have trust, you know, I will often point, point out to self-employed business owners who, who promise me like, no, I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of trust and I say, huh, then why is it you behave in a way that the whole the weight of the world is on your shoulders? Hmm. What I'm seeing in your behavior is that everything's up to you and you're carrying the stress level like everything is on your shoulders, as I said, and, and you're coming to me for more success in your life. So here's my challenge. My challenge is if you're going to behave as if the whole the weight of the world is on your shoulders, you have to understand that what you will see in your life is limited by how much you can carry. But what if you trust? What if you trust in forces bigger than yourself who can help carry some of that weight? And Claire, admittedly, trust has been my biggest factor. Uh, I've always been just so independent minded that it's all up to me. And as there's a bit of advice, the only bit of advice I've ever received from my father, my father died when I was pretty young, man of viewer, very few words. We didn't have too many conversations in the years that, uh, that we, we shared a home. But the one thing he stated to me, which really stuck with me, is that he said, no one's going to care about your life as much as you do. Mm, now, say that one again. Say no one again. is going to care about your life as much as you do. Mm. Now, to be honest with you, he said it in a tone that, as a child, felt to me like, you're alone, kid. <laughs> It wasn't said in a very favorable way, but me being who I am, I'm like, okay, what can I learn from this? And what I took from that was if no one's going to care about my life as much as I do, then I better take care of myself, which is mm -hmm. why I became self-employed. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to see to it that I have an income. I'm going to see to it that, that I make my own way. Um, so I've always been so independent minded that trust has been a challenge for me because if you inherently, if someone, if you know, your father told you that no one's going to care about your life as much as you do, then what's, who's the trust? What's the trust? Yeah. But it was I've, my word of the year a couple yeah, of years ago, because I realized I wasn't trusting. The importance and, of it. Yeah. And well, and you have to be careful with whom, in, in what you trust. Yeah. You know, yeah. but you have to trust because it's too heavy. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a, point. what I'm encouraging people to do is trust in something bigger than yourself. If that's your God, your spirit, your universe, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And one of the exercises I, I propose is to create a trust challenge, uh, excuse me, a trust mantra. Mm -hmm. And my trust mantra, which I will share, it's personal, personal to me, but I'll share it. My trust mantra is that when it looks like the world is falling apart, to trust that it's falling together for something bigger than I can imagine. Mm -hmm. And to really believe that, you know, because we all go through times when it looks like the world is falling apart, like things that just do not make sense. Yeah. But to really, it has changed my life to be able to lean into the trust that I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why this is falling apart. I don't know why I'm hitting resistance, mm. but I trust that what's being created is bigger than I ever could have imagined because my imaginations, all of our imaginations are limited by our predisposed definitions of how big we think we can be. And maybe the world thinks I'm bigger than I am. Maybe the universe thinks I'm bigger than I am. And yeah. I'm gonna trust that that's a possibility. Oh, so, so many things came up for me in, in listening to you there. Number one is that in the coach training that I completed about five years ago, that helped me step into not so being attached to an outcome and sort of being trusting that things were going to evolve. This is going to be a journey and there's no point being so precise and defining what we're expect expecting because all kinds of untold wonderful things that can happen that you just didn't even see coming. Right. Yeah. 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 Gosh, I, I can tell you the most profound story about that. I'll try to keep it brief is that um, I lost somebody many years ago, very important to me, my yoga teacher of 13 years. Oh. So when you spend you know, 13 years every Thursday morning with the same person at 8 a.m. in New York City, which was like an hour and 15 minute commute for me, like that's commitment. Wow. And um, she, she got a very rare form of cancer 
which challenges everything, right? Because we think if we evolved to being higher spiritual beings, if mm. she literally has done yoga her entire life, I studied Iyengar yoga, which is a very specific type of yoga. Her mother brought Mr. Iyengar to the United States to in introduce Iyengar yoga to the United States. So her lineage was amazing. Like it challenges your your understanding of spirituality when somebody like that gets mm -hmm. cancer. It's like, oh, okay, isn't your isn't your enlightened body supposed to be free of that? Right. Which of course is not true. And she had a, it was an extremely rare form, like the abdominal wall. I didn't even know there was such a thing. And um, it was taking her life very quickly, and she very quickly couldn't necessarily teach, but sporadically she would. And one day she came to class. She had the strength to teach. Have, of course, having been through. Uh, radiation, which again, in the spiritual community, in the yoga community, people are like, well, will she choose Western medication or will she believe that her spirituality can heal herself? Mm. And she did end up doing chemo. So I had this moment with her after class once and I said, so Mary, how are you really doing? And she said, Claire, this is so profound. She said to me, I'm learning to walk towards life without being attached to the outcome, mm. right? So she was giving it her all to live and was completely, and I believed her in that moment when she said it completely unattached to the outcome. And that is how I've learned to live every moment since. It's like mm. we can do, and that's actually in an interesting way, Claire, it is the entire basis of my book and why I created the self-employed ecosystem. Because my point is, is that when we become self-employed, everyone thinks they're becoming self-employed because they're gonna control their destiny. They're gonna control their future. They're gonna control their hours, to which I always ask, and how is that going for you? And mm -hmm. everybody laughs, right? Because it's it's a myth of entrepreneurship that you're going to control anything when you're entering uncontrollable circumstances. But here's the answer to that. And that's what this book is about. The truth matters. We can't control the world. The only thing we can control is the environment that we set up for the results that we want. That's what I teach. The self-employed ecosystem is mm -hmm. here is how to create the environment for the results that you want in your life, the results you want in your business. Yeah. After that, you have to let go. Because if you have created the ultimate perfect environment for the results you want in your life, you can't fault yourself. You can't feel like it's a failure. You can't blame yourself. You have created the best circumstances for what you want in your life. You've manifested, you've visualized it. What else yeah. can you do? Then you can relax and let it unfold. And then, exactly, it's the yeah. relaxation of it. Like I said, I think it's important that we have a sense of control. And we should have control when we're in business for ourselves. Mm -hmm. What we can control is the environment. What you can control is how you market in a way that's, that is efficient and effective works. What you can control is the environment in which you work to increase your productivity. What you can control are the environment. You can't control the results in an uncontrollable world, but you, yeah. you increase your likelihood of the results you want because of the environment you set up. I love it. It's And you control the approach you're bringing to this, which is yeah. really a powerful perspective and to do with this mindset piece. So I love that. The other thing that I just adore, and I even talked about it in a workshop I gave last week, this sense of, you know, we need to be able to reflect and I call it tuning in before we lean in, right? Mm -hmm. And you have a what's going right journal practice mm -hmm. that you do that you do religiously yeah. and I want, can you just give us a, a brief description of what that is because i thought it's a, it's a power tool for a number of reasons yeah it's it's the only content that's that's carried from my first book into my second book because i introduced it in my first book and i'm like you know what it's the best tool I know of, so I'm going to repeat it. And I yeah. talked about it. I mean, and I will probably talk about it forever <laughs> because I'm okay with repeating content that works. And you got me talking about it going, I just learned of this perspective and it's so powerful. Yeah. And I think what's, un what's important to understand is how it came about, first of all. So it's, it's, it's a different version of a gratitude journal in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. The reason is, is that I... I am somebody who expects results. I will put, I will do all the work. I say, I will go as woo woo as anybody, but I don't like to just go around rabbit holes that don't have a positive impact on my life or other people's lives. Uh, actually, I, I took ownership, if you will, the hashtag, hashtag woo woo in your wallet uh, to try to reinforce that point. It's like, I'll go there, but it has to have tangible results. And I was challenged with a gratitude journal that I just didn't, I personally, I think it's a wonderful, I think gratitude is an incredible value and mindset shift. But for me, I was challenged to buy, I didn't stick with it. Every time I tried a jet gratitude journal, I didn't stick with it because mm -hmm. I'm pretty grateful for everything. I innately have a grateful attitude on life. So it was just too big, too big and too broad. 
So I was looking for something more tangible and I created this idea of the What's Going Right journal. And I created it at a time when it would appear to, well, I don't know how it appeared to others. I don't really care. It appeared to myself that everything was going wrong. You know, I had recently moved to Miami. I had, I thought I had more time before I, I kind of pulled back in my photography to only realize that no, my photography career went off the cliff much quicker than I thought. Once I moved away from Manhattan, um, a broken relationship. So a lot of things had compounded that there wasn't, didn't feel like a lot was going right. And I figured the only way to correct that mm -hmm. is to use what I know to be true, which I think many of us do is that what you focus on, you get more of. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, knowing that power that what we focus on, we get more of. What if I focus more on what's going right? I don't see it. It might be few and far between, but damn it, I'm going to find it. So I started journaling what's going right. And it was actually so difficult for me. I had to do it in the beginning. It's a two-step process. So first I would get up in the morning, have my chai tea, do some reading, and I would sit down and I would try to journal. And I would be hard pressed to come up with anything that was going right. Hmm. I would come up with a couple things. And then I'd out of frustration, I'd look, okay, this is, I hit it. I hit a wall. So then I would get my dogs on their leashes and I'd go for a good 45 minute walk on the beach. And while I was walking my dogs, things started coming. Oh, well, that's going right. Oh, I forgot about that purse that reached out to lend their support. Oh my gosh, I forgot about the new client I got yesterday. So then I'd come home and I'd finish up the journal. Uh, so it, there was this pause of self-reflection. Right. Right. In a, in a, and walking, because that's, yeah. that's a power tool too. Yeah. It, but the challenge was trying to force to see what's going mm -hmm. right was challenging. When I yes. let go of that, the awareness of what's going right came in. Mm -hmm. Now I can sit down and on demand name what's going right. Right. So you train mm -hmm. yourself into the practice because yeah. I've been doing it for so many years, but the magic of it is that when you focus more on what's going right, you will mm -hmm. see more of what's going right. And it's not just, it's not just woo woo that's science as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's your, we are as humans born to be aware of our threats. We're born, our brains are wired for survival. Yeah. This is retraining the brain to not see the threats, the co competition, the feelings of uh, comparison to others on Facebook. It's retraining all that nonsense to seeing what's going right. Mm. And it starts getting so evident. Like every day of my life, it's like I can find the smallest and the biggest of things that's going right. Hands and down, best practice. Absolutely, I agree with you. I I came. I, I heard you talk about it before, and I adopted it then, and then I read it again, and I realized just hearing it that one time. So for all you listeners out there, this is could be a life changing thing for you. It is such a powerful, easy thing to do to change your perspective and what you're looking at. And it's a way to celebrate this noticing of good things is inherently a celebration of what's going right too. So we don't often do that enough as self employed people We're feeling yeah. like we need to be everything to everybody and everywhere all at the same time. And so sometimes what's is, going right is your effort. You know, I actually posted something mm -hmm. in my Facebook group yesterday today to um, acknowledge your efforts, not just your achievements. Oh, I love that. Right. Yeah. Because it's something, you know, so some, what's going right is the effort you're putting in. You know, I sometimes will acknowledge the effort I'm putting into doing my what's going right journal, <laughs> you know, right? that's worth of it. It's worth. So sometimes it's, that's, it's just such a great practice to just acknowledge the efforts as well as the evidence. Yeah. Right. So it's both. Well, this just put into my mind, I've started a, an online community on Facebook recently, and I am celebrating the fact that I show up there every day. Mm -hmm. And this is something, and you talk about consistency in your book, you know, that showing up, that ability to, to be present for that thing you're committing to. And this is the first time I've finally, finally figured it out, out what I want to show up for. And I get to look forward to this thing. So this is, and, and we, you know, it's early days yet. I think we're at 145 members. So it's in its nice. infancy, but it's, but I'm, I'm so on fire for it and excited about it. And it's, it's like, it's like all of a sudden I've got a little plant and I've got to nurture it and I've got to care for it. And it's just, but this, what's going right is what am I doing in this space to, to kind of attract people to it? And what's also interesting is, so I've, I've really integrated things recently by taking my, a big mission and marrying it with my business objectives. Mm -hmm. So even this awareness piece is a big win for me. If I get the, you know, working with a highly sensitive population, that's what it's about. If I get some awareness out there, that's a win. So I'm celebrating not just the end financial goal that I'm hoping this will contribute to, 
but also this, you know, mission piece, the why, which is also something you talk about, and you know, being value aligned in what you're doing in your business and having your business reflect your values as as our friend Brent Brent uh, Menswar talks about in Black Sheep, mm -hmm. you know, which is also a big part of what shaped you in getting to this place, right? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, if actually we, we, you start to realize when you're acknowledging what's going right is that 99% of what's going right have to do with other people. And that to me starts, it just, you feel like you're in a more loving world when you start, like what, you, what you're seeing what's going right is that people, uh, so somebody, you know, a speaker friend of ours, I'll leave names out of it, but a mutual speaker friend of ours, um, and I'm not leaving a name out because it's a bad thing. It's actually a wonderful thing. But I, uh, I was kind of caught up in a little bit of a firestorm on Facebook recently, and she saw it, and she just like dropped in message. She just like dropped this picture of a puppy. She goes, "I think you need a puppy today." Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. So you can be assured she was on my "What's Going Right" journal the next day. I'm like, "How cool is that?" Like she saw this conversation going on from mm -hmm. afar, and she just dropped. It was a picture of her and a puppy. She was visiting a friend who had a puppy, and she says, "I think you could use a picture of a puppy today." And there she is holding this oh. puppy. You know, I mean, that's what's going right. And if when you, yeah. like I said, 99% of the time, but it involves the way people show up in our lives, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see what's going right. I, I love that. I, that's a beautiful moment and definitely to celebrate it. I also like something you talked about in the book, how we might see a version of ourselves, but if we're listening to how other people see us, that sense that other people might see more for us than we can even see for ourselves. So I joined you my very first time in Clubhouse. And I know I talked way too much in that. I have to figure out this format. I was just like, ah, I'm going to go to crazy, and stick it it's in. It's a crazy format. So. But you introduced me to the group as a productivity and wellness or well-being expert. And, and no one had called me that before. But you are the reason that because you see me that way and it's a big it's one third of what i talk about i had just never named it it's now part of the the description of the group that i've created it's about productivity and well-being oh, so that's that so was cool. that's i always you. thought you were just a well-being expert like to me that's how you show up in the world but mm -hmm. to your point i mean that's actually the premise of my tedx talk the tedx talk is about just that it's the entire premise of it is that uh, it's it's this interplay between expectations and how other people see us because yeah. expectations by definition is a predetermined outcome. So I don't care how much you expect, I don't care how much, how little or how much you expect of yourself or how much you think you're going to go beyond your, your expectations. Expectations by definition is a predetermined outcome. So you have already, no matter how big you think you're going to be, you've predetermined what you think you're capable of. Mm -hmm. The only way to break that, the only way to be bigger in our lives than we could possibly imagine is to trust that what other people see in us may be true and to believe them. And if you, I've sat back for years and watched countless award shows, whether it's the Oscars or the Grammys or, you know, sports awards. And I've just sat back to watch repeatedly when people receive accolades for their accomplishment they acknowledge that somebody else saw more in them than they saw themselves. It mm -hmm. may have been a coach. It may have been their peers. And, you know, I actually joke in my TEDx talk, because I kind of looped it around to my own coming out story. Because the, uh, the first thing I say when I come out on the stage is it's like, you know, we all have clauses to come out of. Mm -hmm. And I use that framework to talk about how there's more in all of us than we see in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, but I also, I loop that around by saying, well, just think about how often somebody comes out as, as gay. And everybody else around them says, oh, yeah, I knew that all along. I was just waiting for you to figure it out. That was my experience. I was like, when I came out at 44 years old, I'm like, why didn't you all tell me? If like you all could see it. Like if it was so obvious. They were like, you didn't see that your, your deep passion for Barbara Streisand and Judy Garland and all that. You didn't see all the things. I'm like, no. <laughs> how did you all see all the stereotypes? <laughs> but that's, you know, but you think of how often does that happen, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody comes out in some way or another in themselves and you're like, yeah, I've seen that in you all along. Mm. It's so, kind of, kind of, there's a beauty, a beauty and a sadness beautiful. in it, right? There's a, I, yeah. That's a great, well, well said, Claire, because there is a beauty and a sadness to it. I, I lean into the beauty of it. Like I mm -hmm. lean into the fact of how beautiful it is, but yeah. you're right. It's, it's sad because sometimes the journey takes a lot longer than, than, to, to see that in ourselves, then maybe we would have liked. That's true. 
That's true. Um, I want to touch on one other point related to the, the self-employed e ecosystem, especially since we're talking to organizing and productivity experts out there. You talk about space switching mm -hmm. as, as a way to kind of fuel your energy and focus during the day. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. I, I found it. I loved it. And it's definitely, it's like my number one efficiency and productivity tip like this or, or tactic. I wouldn't even say it's a tip because it, sometimes tips can people don't take tips in like, no, this is a tactic. Yeah. Pay strategy. attention. This is, a, this right. is absolutely actually this is, do yeah. actually do this because it works. Um, because it's not it's a not, hack people. It's not no. a hack. <laughs> it's an answer to a couple things. One, it's an, it's an answer to the fact that when we're self-employed, we have to wear a thousand hats. Okay. So it's an answer to that. It's also to me, the most important part of, of the strategy of, of space switching is I am constantly encouraging people that I work with, self-employed business owners, creative thinkers. So I think the two go hand in hand. You don't have to be in a creative business, but you are by nature a creative thinker if you chose to be self-employed because you, you're you going to be creatively solving a lot of problems. Okay. And, you know, we are the folks that the world has been telling us to focus, to sit still, stop getting distracted. We're the folks that, you know, we go into business, people said you can only be successful if you pick a niche. And everything about that is against our nature. And I feel like we are the ones that see more and feel more and the world needs more of us. So I have been a, an advocate and a proponent for leveraging that best in people and, and allowing and space switching oddly does that because my feeling is, hey, guess what? You're going to chase squirrels. Hey, guess what? You're going to multitask. That is who you are. It's beautiful. Don't change it. How can we leverage it? So what I've learned to do is set up various Again, everything in my world is about environments. Set up the re set up the environment for the results you want. So what I do is I set up seven. I personally have seven environments in my apartment, and this does not require a lot of space. I, Claire, Claire, you've actually been to my home. It's not a massive apartment by any stretch. Um, so this is doable for anybody. But it's I have seven environments. Each environment has a specific task that I do in that environment. Task switching costs a lot of efficiency because when we task switch our brain has to go down and come back up to the new task, okay? But when you inv when you space switch, you're tripping the brain to get immediately into the task of that space. Yeah. So I have a creative space, which for me is, it's, you know, we're just talking about standing versus sitting. I pretty much stand all day, except when I write. So my creative space is a sitting space out on my terrace, looking out at the ocean. It's not horrible. It's that's not why, horrible. It's not horrible. <laughs> it's so but not then, horrible. <laughs> but that's where I wrote the entire book. That's my creative and writing space. Mm -hmm. And then I have a um, what I call my work alone space, which is my favorite space. Um, and it's it's a stand up desk that's suction cupped to a floor to ceiling window looking out of the ocean. Um, that's my work alone space. What that means is I can play music on the stereo. I'm returning emails. I'm not going to be on video. I could be, but it's my living room. I want to keep that private. Um, so I can, that's where I do emails and all that sort of stuff. I also, I look at a lot of people's websites and I do client, I'll do client work behind the scenes, client work there. Mm -hmm. And then I have my podcast, but I call my, my call space. And that is where I do podcasting. That's uh, where I, I do podcast interviews, both as the host and guest. That's where you uh, are right now. Where I am right now. This right? is, it's my Zoom call space. So when I'm doing Zoom calls with clients right here. Just to my left is my admin space. Literally, like I'm, it's right here. It's the same desk. So I have a right. stand up desk on half the desk, the other, right. and that's my admin desk. There I sit. That's where I pay bills, pay taxes, do the things that none of us enjoy doing, except <laughs> I have a Buddha there. I have a cast iron open arms, open hands. I have a candle I always burn because when I'm paying bills, I burn candles. And I have a picture of my kids because that reminds me of what my life is about and what I'm working for, even though they're all financially independent, I'm still working for them in my own way, because, mm. you know, they, you know, we spent so much of our lives that them trying to make me proud. Now I live to make my kids proud. <laughs> mm. Right. That's so beautiful. I keep, I keep yeah. them there to, to try to honor that and try to make them proud. So, and then I I go to a shared workspace and I want to point out the importance of that. Like I happen to belong to a WeWork shared mm -hmm. space, which is in my neighborhood, but it has actually been proven uh, that the noise level at a typical coffee shop is at the exact decibel level that creates it increases productivity in the brain. It's loud enough to be like white noise, but not so loud that you can discern individual words. Yeah. And you actually can be more productive in a shared workspace. So it's it's, it's fascinating that because yeah. as a highly Isn't sensitive it? person looking at that, I mean, I would go to a library at university 
I would promptly fall asleep. There wasn't enough stimulation Correct. and I would get the sniffles. Like you're supposed to be quiet and all of a sudden I'd be like my nose oh, that's is That's when blind. you have to sneeze. Like, oh my God, right? It was <laughs> yes. awful. And I would fall asleep. I'm like, how yeah. do people work here? There wasn't enough stimulation. Correct. And quickly, if I'm in a coffee shop and they're grinding beans constantly, I might find it too much noise. Yeah. So really, you know, paying attention to the stimulation, the level of stimulation yeah. that you need from an oral point of view, from a visual point of view. I love your essential perspective to shaping the space by yeah. adding scent in, for example. And, yeah. and I'm I, very driven yeah. by scent. And I think that's part of it, knowing what you're driven by, right? Yes. I'm very driven by scent, which I've always joked because I, um, I've always had a, I've always been well endowed in the nose nasal capacity. And my grandmother used to tell me, don't worry, you'll grow into it. Who is <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother's Portuguese, by the way, not Jewish, although that sounded completely, you know, not Portuguese, but my grandmother was Portuguese, but in her Portuguese accent, she would say, don't worry, you'll grow into it. And in some, to some degree I did, but I'm very driven by scent. Like scents can really change my mood. I burn a candle mm -hmm. every night. I, I have a favorite candle company uh, that I'm ridiculously passionate about. And I burn a candle every night as I, as Rob and I sit and watch TV or what have you. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm very driven by scent. So I will alter my mood and alter my environment by scent. So you're very influenced by color. Yeah. You know, and, and that's your thing. So your space would need to involve that. But uh, space switching is a... a, a Talk about, you know, again, since efficiency and productivity is what your audience is looking for. I think, honestly, space switching is incredibly efficient. You, you, you move to a, another space and boom, your brain is in gear. Yeah, absolutely. It's triggers and yeah. your brain responds to those triggers. So you can speed up your flow into that new Correct. task. Right? And it, like I said, yes. it allows you to be who you are. It allows you yeah. to, to need to be driven to, by change and yeah. to know that it's okay to be that person. Embrace it and make the best of it. Well, taking that word embrace, I'm going to segue right into the next thing I want to talk about, which is taking the bull's eye off your customer's face and instead thinking about your concept called hug marketing. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I felt that and I just felt this tension leave my body. And what came to me was this feeling of being a magnet. Mm -hmm. And I've got this magnet and I'm going to, you know, magnets attract some. Mm -hmm. things and repel, and repel others, others. Mm -hmm. right? And so I, I don't want it to, I would like, since you're here to explain mm -hmm. your concept of hug marketing, because I think it's so beautiful. And it just made me feel really excited about marketing in a way I haven't felt after 15 Correct. years of marketing before I became an entrepreneur. So yeah, it's, and that's, it the, that's the point behind it. It's a huge energy shift. Mm -hmm. And often our energy is shifted by words. And you're know, going to have a guy who, who wrote a book called Lingo. I'm obviously really picky about words, one word at a time. And I'm going to be really picky about it. Um, and there's, I would say the majority of marketing words are horrible, horrible energy. You know, if you look at, if you, if you talk about your customers as a target audience, guess what? They're going to feel the energy of being targeted. Mm -hmm. If you refer to, you can't, you can't, the word marketing is always followed by marketing to or marketing at, right? Mm. And so in my business, we use the, we've replaced marketing with enrolling. I don't look at my, my job as marketing to people. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't have a marketing plan. If you were to look at my, my uh, notes of my business and our mission, uh, you won't see a marketing plan. You'll see enrolling plan. Like what is our plan to enroll clients? Right. It's not what is my plan to market to people. And funnel, marketing funnel has Ugh. been my, one of my biggest pet. Exactly. It, it makes you want to vomit for, for those of us that are. And here's the difference. Am I going to say a marketing funnel is gross for everybody? No, because if that's who you are, that's what your business is. If that's, that's typical business. But for those that are self-employed and are in relationship-based businesses and tend to be driven by our heart or purpose, and you know that's how we're driven, mm -hmm. uh, we, we want to vomit. We think funnel. And, and I just look at not only the word, the visual of it. So what does a funnel look like? It looks like, and energetically, it's as if you're open-hearted and open-minded at the top and welcoming and only to squeeze people as they get closer to you through a small it's hole. It's like a messy birth. Really. It's, all, it's like, oh. <laughs> I should say, oh, horror. I just energetically, it always felt horrible to me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to change it. I came up with this concept of hug marketing, which instead of a funnel, a hug, hug marketing as a frame uh, work looks like a series of concentric circles. Mm -hmm. And this immediately energetically shifts your mind into these, these concentric circles, the center circle being surrounded by all the others, that center is the hug, as, yeah. as a hug is, it's a surrounding. 
I also love the way it shifts the burden of responsibility and self-employed business owners. Because as, as much as you know, I'm an advocate for self-employed business owners, and and you know, I'm all in for them. But I'll also have no problem whipping into shape sometimes. And I and this is an area I will. It's like I just I have little tolerance for excuses such as oh the economy is bad. Or it's like all that may be true. The economy might be bad. The market may have shifted. There may have been a global pandemic. My point is, is it doing you any good? to focus on that? Mm. No, right? So what I like about Hug Marketing is it shifts the burden of responsibility to look at your business, both emotionally and logically. If you imagine these series of concentric circles and the outermost circle, for example, are, I refer to them as lurkers. Those are people that are watching what you're doing. They're your podcast listeners, Claire, that you don't know by name right now, mm -hmm. but you're building an audience of lurkers. You're building an audience of people that are following you and watching you. They're not just following you, they're watching you, they're lurking. So the next inner circle is curious. So my question from a practical standpoint is what are you doing to take to, to inspire a lurker to become curious? right? So it ups the game as far as your content development, what you're putting out there, that you're putting out content that, that they might notice from afar, but now they're curious about it. Mm -hmm. And then can you take them from curious to engage? Like, well, how are you, what are you providing to actually, now you're getting them so curious, they're engaging in your content. They're posting on your, your posts, they're commenting. Mm -hmm. And then we take them and connect it. How do we get them connected, fully connected? Connecting is a big, big stage because usually it requires some maybe surrendering of an email. Maybe they've opted into your list. Um, it's literally to go from engaged to connected from the customer's perspective, they are to some degree handing over to control. They are saying, I have enough a relationship of trust with you that I'm mm. gonna hand over my email and trust that you're going to handle it and me gently mm -hmm. and kindly because you're now well, they're now welcoming a two-way conversation where before it was kind of only a monologue coming from them to you. And yeah. then of course, from connected, you want to turn them to customers, but we're not done there. And that's where most businesses are in. You then want to focus on how do you turn your customers into hug customers? And mm -hmm. those are the customers that you can't imagine seeing in person when you wouldn't hug them. Like you've built that level of loyalty. Right. And that level of appreciation. Appreciation, yeah. loyalty. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I recently gave, um, I really, I'm just now starting to give keynotes and presentations on the book. And mm -hmm. And in working that out, I, as an example of that hug experience, I, I explained because it has stuck struck to me as I was building up my keynote that every child I've ever photographed for 36 years of being a photographer, every child calls me Jeffrey Shaw. One word, Jeffrey Shaw. <laughs> and it, they say it so fast, every child, Claire, like every Jeffrey Shaw. When I pull in the driveway, they come running out of the board. Jeffrey Shaw is here. Jeffrey Shaw is here. When I'm photographed, they're like, Jeffrey Shaw, do you want me to stand over here? Jeffrey Shaw, should I do this? <laughs> And I have no idea why, like every child calls me by my whole name. Parents laugh at it. They sometimes start joking, calling me Jeffrey Shaw. For some reason, it's easier for kids to say Jeffrey Shaw. It's like a flow. Yeah. And it's, it's the kids that call me that you have no idea how endearing that is. Like they, they, it's like these, those are the very same kids. I hug when I see them with mm -hmm. their permission, <laughs> I will mm -hmm. always hug them when I see them. Yeah. And that is that's a hug client whether it's the kids or the adults you know because if i'm that way with the kids that's the way i am with the adults as well but that that's a sign it's like i've gotten in their hearts i've gotten in their place in life where they're calling me jeffrey shaw that's cute but i think i nearly called you jeffrey shaw it's, <laughs> well that's because you've like, got the spirit of a child i guess <laughs> oh maybe more than that but yeah that's that's beautiful i have because um i have the privilege and honor and um I'm blessed to be speaking with you directly. Of course, I have to ask you a personal business question in here. And it ties to something you're very passionate about. And it also ties to something I've just feel like I've done, which is counter to what your advice is. So you say, ditch the niche. Mm -hmm. And I was reading that going, oh, but I've just decided that I wanna work with highly sensitive professionals. Have I done something wrong in this time where because of the internet and you know the way our world works you can be found for doing something small i'd love you to expand on that mm. point and what you act what you mean by you know ditch the niche what, yep. what do you mean it's, it's so important so what we need to ditch the old definition of niche right because what okay. we've been told is that we need to pick one thing for one audience mm. um or just one thing or one audience and my point is is that no the niche 
actually is your area of expertise. Your niche is what resides within you for which there are multiple audiences and multiple ways of executing it. So no, you haven't done the wrong thing. You've done very the right thing. You've dropped into the area, the space in the world that you have a particular skill set, passion, instinct, awareness, empathy, all those words. Like that's your space that you that you thrive in, which is taking care of the world of highly sensitive people, for which there are multiple audiences in multiple ways that you can get that message out there. And I'll, I'll give you a, a practical awareness of that that just came to me is that I'm in the process of launching a new a whole new YouTube channel. I'm stripping down what's there and I'm putting up a whole new channel that's going to be highly organized um, mm -hmm. because it dry, I, I'm a complete neat freak and I don't like that it's just been a kind of a repository. You know, so everybody do... here just is sending you hearts right now that's listening, right? We're just <laughs> yeah, like, so get me some I'm more getting that really, giving that really organized and um, the uh, lost my train of thought. New YouTube channel. The, the niche. About, yeah. Oh my gosh, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, I'm sorry. That's because I interrupted you, which is <laughs> terrible. I just wanted to send you some love for being this ultra organized. So, so guy. the area of area of expertise. Um da, 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 da. Oh gosh, I actually don't remember why I was leading towards towards YouTube YouTube. Why are you creating a new channel? You wanted to to, to refine what was um, there and serve it yeah, up? Yeah, I do. And I, I also want to again, I guess it's because kind of like I want to own my space, right? My space is in that of self-employment. So I want to make sure everything that's there applies to them. Whether, like I said, it's, it's multiple audiences available in yep. different, you know, this it's my area of expertise, but yep. for which there are multiple audiences. And it's just, to me, it's just another way I can deliver that. It's and it's a kindness. Yeah. It's a kindness to your audience to be yeah. curating oh, this. All right, I remembered. Did we get there? So <laughs> yes. Like, the reason it, the reason it, that came up was because this was so new to me. It was so, and that's probably that's kind of why it slipped my mind because this is it's, it was so off my radar. But it's so true to to highly sensitive people. Mm. So my my podcast recording platform. I don't use Zoom. I use another one that re has video, but they. You used to not be able to record it. Now you can record the video. So I had this idea. It's like, oh, well, maybe I can capture a YouTube audience by capturing the video from the YouTube, from, um, as you do, the video yeah. from the podcast and move it to YouTube. So I've, I've, I'm working with a YouTube coach and I brought this to his attention. And, and I honestly, I'm looking, I'm thinking, my interviews are like 40, 45 minutes long. Like who's going to sit there and watch two people have a conversation for 40 minutes? I'm thinking this isn't appealing to anybody. But I started asking other people. One of the people I asked was my daughter my youngest daughter who has had various issues with anxiety in her life. And I, I sent by asked her cause she's younger. It's like, you know, she's a, she's a Gen Z actually. I said, how do you listen to podcasts? She goes, she goes, Oh, I only watch podcasts on YouTube. It's like, why? She goes, mm -hmm. because I'm highly, you know, she goes, you know about my anxiety. She goes, I'm highly sensitive. She goes, I, I find it very unsettling to just listen to somebody, people talking in my ears. I need to see their faces. I oh, need wow. to see the expressions. And I, I, was so curious about that. I opened it up to a larger group of people and found out there are, there are a lot of people that are highly sensitive mm -hmm. and actually need to see the facial gestures in order to absorb the content and be comfortable with the conversation. That's fascinating to right? learn, which is, I'm thrilled that you're sharing that because it's instinctive to me to say, you know, there's certain information I like to take in, in different ways. Mm -hmm. And if, I'm recording and video anyway, yeah. then of course let me serve the audience. Right. But that's the point, Claire. Yeah. Of course it's it's natural to you. Yeah. For me, yeah. it was so foreign to me. Like I just yeah. don't have that sensitivity. Yeah. I'm I I, you know, I just don't I don't have that. The people you cater to. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I'm not your ideal customer, right? Because that's I don't have those highly sensitive high sensitivities. But that's my point. There's a world of people that do. And here is one of my core principles in business that I'll that I'll, I'll I'll leave with you. And, and I think it's so important to consider is that I truly, this is my task as a small business coach. I truly believe there's a world of people waiting for you to show up. Mm. Okay, there's a world of people waiting for everyone listening to this. There's a world of people waiting for you to show up. The key is that you need to drop further into who you are. So they know who you are. You need to have a brand message that communicates who you are so that they can find you you need to put yourself out there bravely, even against your own comfort, because we only step out of what's uncomfortable. We step out of our comfort zone when the impact we want to create is bigger than our fears. 
You drop into all of that and you will be shocked. That's, that is creating the environment for the results you want. Because if you drop into all that, you'll be shocked at how easy it is for the people you're meant to serve to show up. It happens with ease because there's a world of people out there waiting for you to show up. I'm giving a beat there, a pause, because that is so profound and beautiful. It's, it's, it's so powerful. And I, I want to say, I mean, I just started this group less than a month ago, no, about a month ago, and decided to commit to serving this niche that I really, really relate to because I'm part of it. And all of a sudden, I'm finding conversations I'm dying to be part of are showing up, the connections and everything, you know, it's like priming what you said, you're creating the environment for the business that you want. And I'm finding it in spades without, without feeling like I'm having to do anything uncomfortable whatsoever. The first step was uncomfortable. It was like, shall mm -hmm. I do this? Shall I place a bet uh, on this? But wow, is it ever unfolding? Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey, this has been such, Jeffrey Shaw, Jeffrey Shaw, this has been a very <laughs> rich. It sticks, doesn't it? You can't unhear it now. <laughs> no, it, do, it does roll together, Jeffrey Shaw. Uh, it, it, it's been such a rich conversation. I'm glad we got to touch on both the practical tactical side of things. It's a really tremendous marketing book. And like I said, it's this very also spiritual guide to set you up with the right mindset and help you get in touch with yourself, celebrate those wins, the what's going right journal to really construct the business that you're going to be able to embrace and dance with for, for a long, long time, because it's going to be so authentically you, it's going to bring you a lot of success. Yeah. Well, that, cause that, that is the self-employed life. I just want to reiterate. And that's why I wrote this book, right? There's, there's, there's business books and there's self-help books. I'm like, but you know, it's interesting as it being a self-employed, how we're so often accused of running all over the place, but everything is scattered for us. And when you're self-employed, it is an integration of our personal lives and our business lives and our, the marketing we need and the self-help that we need and the personal development we need and the habits we need. And no one has ever brought it together until now. Like this book includes all of that because it's, it is literally, because I've done the research, it's the only book that is all-inclusive of what it actually feels like to be self-employed with the marketing strategies, the personal development and the habits and mindsets that you need. Exactly that. You summed it up beautifully. I encourage everyone to check it out. It's uh, it's available in May of 2021. May, mm -hmm. May it's available now for pre-order, but it goes yeah. uh, launches May 4th. Yeah, may the fourth be with you, with, <laughs> with, this, with the strength of this book. So thank you, Jeffrey, uh, for joining us. To all the listeners out there, I hope you've really taken some gems away with you from this rich discussion. Uh, you can find more episodes, as always, at napopodcast.com. And don't forget to check out the YouTube playlist uh, on the Napo site. You can find bonus content for every episode that I've been recording lately. We are doing a bonus question over on YouTube. You can also see the space that Jeffrey's in right now to understand where he's working to do his podcast and just what that looks like. So I hope you'll tune in again soon till the next episode. Do stay safe, be kind and enjoy your journey. Jeffrey, I have one more question for you. There were so many incredible nuggets in this book. And one thing that I hadn't really heard of before was this business model of multiples. And I thought this would be some rich insight to share with the crowd listening out there too. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So uh, it's different than diverse income streams or multiple income streams, right? Because one lesson many people, many businesses have learned is they need to diversify their income streams, diversify their income, which is true. And, and business model of multiples will accomplish that. But I like to offer a different framework because inherently in, in being self-employed, one of the biggest challenges is that we are trying to control so many things in uncontrollable circumstances. And the fact of the matter is business is largely uncontrollable. Markets go up and down, economies shift, market trends, etc. I actually believe that having a business model of multiples is probably the most control you can gain in your business. And it's quite visual. So let me describe it visually first. Uh, I look at it as standing, be, imagine you're standing before a, a control panel of levers. And each lever represents a, an activity and an income stream in your business. 
Like for our sound people out there, it's the mixing board. Correct. It's a mixing <laughs> right? board. Actually, it's right? a great example. It's like a mixing board. It's a panel of levers. Somehow I always feel like it's so futuristic. I just imagine myself before this huge board of levers. And we have the control to decide which levers we want to ramp up and which ones we want to pull down. Some levers, like for many of us that are professional speakers, that lever was yanked down real quick, March 13th of 2020, <laughs> when we found all our <laughs> events were canceled. Slamming down. It was yeah. slammed down and caught our finger on the underneath it. Um, but you know, if you have a business model of multiples, you can look at the other levers and say, okay, which ones can I ramp up? Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, as a as a, one of the things that I do is uh, I help businesses with their brand messaging. I help them create compelling brand messaging on their websites to attract their ideal customers. And I figure, well, that's the perfect lever to ramp up because this is exactly mm -hmm. what companies and businesses will have time to do now that there's not as much outreach. And sure enough, that that one lever carried me pretty much through the entire year. Um, but I've also got the lever of, you know, I've got royalties that come in inadvertently due to, uh, you know, courses I have out and book sales, et cetera. Uh, I still do very little photography, but the photography lever has been being pulled down slowly over the last 12 years to make room for all the other levers. Mm -hmm. um, I do a small business. My primary role is a small business coach. That's how I spend most of my day. That's the lever that's, that's pushed up to the top. It is expected to be the primary income earner. So when you start looking at his levers, and I also have a, a lever, if you will, for you know brand sponsorship, which right now is pulled all the way down by not so much by choice, but it just has it's not getting the attention yet. But it's the next. I have a very I have a large social media following, and I know there's an opportunity for me to leverage some brand sponsorship and stand behind companies that I really believe in. So it's a lever I created. It's sitting there waiting for my attention, mm -hmm. and when I'm ready to give it attention, I'll start pushing that lever back up. But it's a feeling of control, Claire. It's a feeling that the world is not going to decide for you whether mm -hmm. you're going to pay the rent that month. You're going to decide what gets your attention, mm -hmm. what makes sense. Some levers you know, do get yanked down and out of our control. But when you have choices, as we know, choice always make, it leads to freedom. And to me, the business model of multiples really embodies giving people control back to their lives and their business and in uncontrollable circumstances of being self-employed. I love that. Is this something that you, you know, as a part of your planning ritual, you might look at your levers and, and that's, that's how you're being intentional. And then also when stuff happens in the world, you go back to that. So it's, it's, it's re something you come back to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I provide a diagram of what, I mean, I literally have a, I literally have a diagram that looks exactly like a control panel of levers. And I have the name that written next to each lever. That's how I, that's how I manage it myself. Cause I'm very visual. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do offer that diagram in, in the book and absolutely. I mean, that relates to my sales projections, a spreadsheet, right? The sales projections, you'll see the income projections for each of those levers, right? So it, it cross matches, but for me, I need to, uh, it even goes right down to my vision. If you were to see, you know, if you were to see my Google doc, which is my vision, mm -hmm. um, it would relate to those, like what I envision, you know, like in 2022, I envision the brand sponsorship lever increasing, right? right? So, cause that's, that's the plan. So I can envision my future based on, because I can start with by visioning the levers. I will add that in my study of businesses and having supported and coach so many self-employed and small businesses. I, I recommend no more than seven mm. levers. Uh, there's a point of, of loss of return. <laughs> there's yeah. a point where it's too much to manage. Um, but I think a business of, of one income stream is downright dangerous today. Mm -hmm. um, as we saw again in speaking, your highest paid speakers uh, who had only the income stream of speakers or were hurt terribly because that's yeah. all they knew, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I there's a point is I think every business should have enough multiples to their business. Mm -hmm. uh, the other component of, I will add, there's a little more flavor, if you will, to the business model of multiples. It also represents what you and I discussed on the podcast about niche marketing mm -hmm. and that the idea of niche is what's the, the area of expertise within you for which there are multiple income streams or multiple audiences and multiple ways you can deliver that. And that's why it's called the business model of multiples. Mm -hmm. It is a, an accurate representation of a business model where you have multiple income streams, multiple uh, audiences, and multiple ways you can get 
your message out there. And that's mm-hmm. why it's called the business model of multiples. And it, it's meant to create exponential growth because it multiplies. I love it. I love it. And it puts you in that control position where you're deciding yes. to what you give your attention, which is correct. That's what you do get to control. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is there anything you'd like to add or comment on around the synergy, whether it's beneficial or not between the seven up to seven different areas? I mean, for the probably from 2009 to 2015, 16, I spent about 30% of my time bringing a product to market. And that was, it was really, it was an organizing, a clothing organizing product. So I was like, everything's fine. It's synergistic. But I know that what the time I spent there meant my organizing and productivity consultancy. It was a, it was a lever that I was pushing up there, but it affected this other lever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk about synergy that, and then we'll, we'll leave it, we'll leave it at this gem. Yeah, but again, it's it, there is this definitely a synergy, Tim, but it's by your choice. And mm-hmm. But I also think it helps to do kind of what you alluded to is it helps keep your awareness when a lever can take on a life of its own and it starts dominating. If you, if you have a higher level of awareness of the other levers, then you're careful not to make sure that one lever isn't completely taking over all the rest mm-hmm. because... And we've, you know, many of us have been in business all the time and know that, you know, you can suddenly turn around and you'll think, oh my gosh, I wish I took care of those other things. Mm, right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I think again, having the awareness that it's healthier to have a business model of multiples, it also brings into the awareness so that you make sure that one hot, a hot moment doesn't suddenly take your eye off everything else. And I, I actually, tell the story in the book about the very, my very first phone call with my very first coach, uh, which I hired a coach in my peak business years because I actually felt it very lonely. Like I, I got to the pinnacle of what I thought success was and felt it, found it really lonely. So I hired mm-hmm. a coach and my very first phone call with him and you know we we're getting down to the practical of business. And I had said, well, here's where I'm at. I said, I, I feel like I'm on a, on a seesaw because one year the volume is up. This is my photography business I was relating to. It's like one year, my volume is up, but the average sales down. And the next year, the average sales up, but the volume is down. I said, so here's our goal. Let's, if we can get the two things together, right? It would be incredible. And he said to me, he goes, you do know it's you that's causing it, right? It's like, what do you mean it's me that's causing it? I'm already thinking, okay, I hired the wrong coach. It's blaming it on me. And he said, well, what's happening, I can guarantee is that the year the average sales down, you're putting all your attention on increasing the average sale, but you're letting go of the attention mm-hmm. of making sure the volume increases. And then the next year, the volume is like, oh, let me do everything I can to increase the volume. And he was a hundred percent right. And I'm like, yep, that, that pretty much explains my behavior for the past 10 years. <laughs> huh. Well, and- yeah, I use an analogy of spinning plates. Like you've yes. got to, you've got to keep the plate spinning. So mm-hmm. you got to watch for that one that's losing. It's starting to yeah. wobble and you got to go give it some love. Yeah, right? Watch that stray child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, I mean that the awareness, every, every change in our life begins with awareness. Once that was brought to my awareness, I'm like, oh, I got this. Like I can, I'm, I actually am capable of keeping my eye on more than one thing. But right. when it's, once it's right. brought to my attention, I realized that I was inadvertently doing that. And, and I find people can keep their eye on the management of a, no more than seven levers, mm-hmm. you know, and some are definitely going to be getting a lot more attention than others. Some may even be dormant, like my pod, you know, brand sponsorship lever to me is kind of dormant right now. Mm-hmm. So it can be there, but be dormant. But like mm-hmm. I said, just having it there dormant puts it in my mind. It's like, okay, that can get attention in 2022. Yeah. It's okay for things to be dormant. <laughs> Most just, definitely. Yeah. It's taking like, a nap. That's right. That's right. Well, that was a gem. I knew it would be. Thank you so much for sharing the business model of multiples. Jeffrey Shaw. Thank you. All right. Have an awesome day.